Okay, if you remember last time we were talking about these snakes and whether or not these king snakes here gain protection by looking like these coral snakes here and they wanted to test that out and here's the data they, they found and they found that yes uh, they did because where the coral snakes were present there was a very large difference between how the attack rates. Um, and so we need to understand that science is a social activity and there's always some sort of teamwork and collaboration. In fact, our collaboration can now uh, be worldwide and technology has made that possible and it's wonderful. Um, this, is, this is kind of important and I may kind of beat this in your head as well. Oops. Um, and that is, let me get my little marker here. Uh, the science seeks natural causation for natural phenomena. Okay? Science cannot delve into the supernatural. Science cannot delve into belief systems. That's not what science can do. It seeks natural causes for natural phenomena. So if you're at a pool table uh, and you hit the, the cue ball, and it hits the eight ball and the eight ball moves, we assume there's a natural cause for that eight ball to move, that it didn't just move on its own or some randomness in the universe made the eight ball move at that moment. We seek for natural causation. So that limits science, it makes science limited uh, because it can't explain the supernatural. But that's okay, it can explain the natural and there's a great, uh, it is the best currently the best way to discover truth and build knowledge about the natural world. So, once again, the science is limited to what we can observe and measure. If we can't measure it, uh, if it can't be observed um, through some sort of instrumentation, then it's not science and it's something else. And it's okay if it's something else, but it just isn't science. So, um, hypotheses about supernatural forces or explanation are outside the bounds of science. Uh, and that's important that, that everyone understands that. So, biology and everyday life, we're gonna talk for a second about that. Uh, we have, a, there's a lot of issues that we have going on. Um, and so we, ocean acidification, uh, science education, freshwater management, species extinction, uh, biodiversity loss. Um, human health is directly correlated with biodiversity. Uh, so as we uh, clear cut rainforest and just plant one, one crop, it, it really um, limits our ability uh, to find medicines, all sorts of different things. So, um, and that's, that's science, that's biology. Uh, we need to understand the difference between biology and science and technology. The goal of science is to understand natural phenomena. The goal of technology is to apply scientific knowledge for some purpose. So this computer, the internet you're using, that's an application of science. It is not science itself, it's an application. Uh, we need both, uh, and they're both very important, but it's important to distinguish between uh, knowledge and application. Um, so uh, technology advances because of science, and once technology advances, um, then we can do more research. So we can't do research without the technology. So science needs business majors to go and find ways to sell that new knowledge and so they can do more science. And business majors need the scientists to give them, the, uh, create the knowledge they need to make, uh, uh, to make and sell new products. So biology and everyday life, so oil spills. Um, that's, that happens quite a lot. Um, science can, can help us deal with that. 
um, we can create bacteria that can break down oils and different things like that. So we don't destroy our, our environment. Sci science and biology can help with that. So evolution is a core theme of biology. Uh, it's useful in medicine, agricultural, for instance, it's conservation, uh, and a host of other things. Uh, it's uh, any, any knowledge, any truth uh, can be applied to um, uh, an enormous uh, amount, have an enormous amount of al applications. And so we can use evolutionary theory to explain behaviors. Uh, um, we can uh, use it to help us understand uh, our relatives, um, both figuratively and literally. Uh, so it's, it's useful um, when we look outside and we want to understand the world around us, evolutionary theory is useful for that. So human-caused environmental change are powerful forces. Um, and we do this by uh, our energy uh, use, um, antibiotic, when our medicines create antibiotic-resistant bacteria, our farming um, create pesticide-resistant pests, um, our growth endangered species, and uh, we are in the middle of a mass extinction. We'll talk more about that when we get to ecology. Um, but the rate at which animals are disappearing uh, is is m massive. It's it's in a uh, hundred times higher than than uh, than normal uh, uh, than it normally has been throughout history. So. Uh, we need to know about that. So here's a couple of questions, and if you want, I'd be happy if you, uh, really appreciate it if you kind of dropped me a line and said, hey, question, you asked this on your lecture, and this is what I think. Um, I, I'd be, uh, it's not required, I'm not going to require this of you, but it is something I want you to think about, and I'd really appreciate it if you shared your thoughts with me. But do you think scientists should take a more active role in helping society to understand and apply their findings. Should scientists be proactive? Um, and that's a question, you, uh, and there's a spectrum of agreement with that. Uh, when scientists start getting active, people start freaking out, especially if the science tells them something they don't want to hear. But regardless of whether people want to hear it or not, should scientists be more active, or should they just say, here's the truth, do with it what you will, and be a completely hands-off? So what do you think about that? Drop me a line, uh, send it to me an email, uh, let me know. Another one, uh, for some, religion and science seem to be at odds. Um, others think that religion and science are too powerful but separate ways of human understanding. Um, and so what, what is your opinion? What do you think about this? Do you think an individual can hold devout religious beliefs but at the same time support scientific understanding? Is that possible? Is it not possible? Uh, go ahead and drop me a line and, and let me know what you think about that. So I'm going to go a little more in depth here uh, for science and we're going to go over another experiment and that is caffeine, coffee, does it help you? Um, so uh, questions about science. Um, let me double check to make sure I'm not passing up where I need to stop this. And we're good for another 11 slides. So how does the scientific method use the test hypotheses? You should know that. Uh, we kind of went over it, but we're going to go over it again to make sure you know it. Um, what factors influence the strength of scientific studies? Uh, uh, when you have two conflicting scientific reports, which one's stronger? How are you going to know? How can you evaluate the evidence in the media, reports, and scientific studies? And how does the scientific method apply in clinical trials? So stuff that really uh, affects you. So science, a method to answer questions, uh, a way of knowing. Remember, uh, it's not just another way of knowing. It is a way of knowing. It builds, uh, discovers truths, and builds knowledge. And we use observation experiments to draw evidence-based conclusions. Unfortunately, faith-based conclusions are not part of science. 
And it's okay to have faith-based conclusions, but just realize that you're not science. So why do we need science to tell us what, uh, to help us find truth? Truth about the natural world, I should add that. Um, why do we need science here? So if you look uh, at this paper I've cited down at the bottom, uh, what that paper talks about is uh, that we blind ourselves. Uh, we only remember what we want to remember. Seems kind of logical. We say that all the time. Let's take, uh, for example, a uh, car accident, and we think it's the other person's fault. We are only going to remember parts of that accident or tell people parts of that accident that paints us in the best of light. That's just plain and simple. That's how we're going to do it. While well, they're only going to remember the parts that paint them in the best of light. Um, so we have this selective memory. And our attitudes, they affect our memory. So our, our attitude about ourselves will, uh, will affect what we, we remember. So we need something objective. We need, hopefully, there was an objective observer. Eyewitness accounts are the least reliable, but just for the assumption for that car accident, if there was an objective observer, then we can start to get at the truth of who turned where and when and at what time. So science, think of science as this objective observer that finds truth. Uh, so is science objective, right, or is it biased? Well, science minimizes bias to a great extent, and we'll talk a little bit about how uh, it does that here in a second. So we often have our own bias, okay, uh, with different, uh, uh, different things, and sometimes our own bias, where we have dogma, I guess you might say, um, it keeps us from looking at topics with an open mind. Uh, there's Al Gore, and he, of course, has his bias. Even though climate change is, is real and we are affecting it, he was still kind of a biased guy, and he wouldn't look at it with an open mind. Um, yeah, he was correct, but he still didn't have an open mind. So on. Um, in, uh, in different ways, when we join a group, we often then kind of toe the party line, I guess you might say, uh, about ideals. And we should never treat any ideal as infallible. Science questions everything. It questions itself. Uh, and that's part of its self-correcting process. But it questions itself all the time to, uh, to keep from, from being biased. So it questions every little bit. So we often, when we're looking at conclusions, uh, we'll hear in the media all sorts of conflicting evidence. Uh, in this case, coffee causes cancer, coffee pre prevents some disease, coffee can be poisonous. All those are, are media um, topics because, uh, unfortunately, in the late 1980s, 1987, um, they, they took a requirement out um, of journalism that required journalists to verify uh, their sources, to verify their claims. In other words, journalism used to be kind of scientific uh, and it had to verify before it could report. It no longer had to do that. And so you got anybody anywhere that can make any sort of claim on the internet, on TV, on the radio, uh, some people in both, uh, or all three places, um, they just, they can find something, someone said this, and therefore that's correct, and they can report it, and that's just, you get all these conflicting reports. That's not science, and those people are not scientists, and most of the time they don't know what they're talking about. The media, um, most of the time, uh, you can just, write it off is probably wrong. Um, so you're going to have to do your own research. But scientists, we find the best evidence available. And then we ask, was the science performed properly? We look, so we go to the literature. We go to specifically peer-reviewed literature. And then we look, was this performed properly? 
and so are those conclusions valid? We understand that conclusions may be modified in the future, and so science is a never-ending process. And this makes some people feel uncomfortable um, because science is not an absolute, and, and so they've, people like absolute answers because then they don't have to work. They don't have to think. They can just say, this is the answer, and I'm done. Think about it when you're going through a class you don't like, maybe even this class, where I give you a question, and uh, all you want to do is just, I want to know the answer so I can be done, so you don't, uh, don't want to think about it. You just want to move through, but is that an education? Um, and so uh, it's a lot easier just to have someone say, this is how it is, and accept that's, that's how it is, and never question it. But science does, and so it's a never-ending process. Uh, and so in that process, we start with an observation. Uh, and observations are often unreliable because they're untested. Um, so we see that observation, we try to come up with an idea, and then we try to look for evidence. And there's different types of evidence. Um, anecdotal evidence is, well, my mom tried it and, and she said it worked. Or all my, all my, my whole family tries this, this oil with it, uh, every night before uh, we go to bed and uh, it helps us sleep better. Um, well, some guy was in a hospital and he tried this special uh, oil on his skin and helped his burns heal faster or whatever. That's all anecdotal evidence. Um, and anecdotal evidence is pretty much worthless. Um, you can use anecdotal evidence as an observation, but it should not be considered uh, valid evidence in any way, shape, or form. Empirical evidence, on the other hand, comes from rigorous studies. Um, uh, stuff, experiments that have been, there, where the methods have been put through uh, rigorous peer review, where we can count on uh, and use those conclusions uh, and use that evidence to build those conclusions, uh, and those conclusions will be much more valid. Uh, correlative evidence where two things seem or seemingly relate, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, but that's correlative. Causative, where we know the mechanism. We've been able to figure out the physics and chemistry of what is going on. So when we talk about vaccines, we know the mechanism of the immune system, so we know vaccines work, and we know they're reliable because we know the causative uh, um, mechanism behind how vaccines work. And then there's statistical uh, evidence. Um, we often gather data and use statistics. Uh, some people say, well, you can prove anything with statistics. And, um, and to a sense, they are correct. But here's the, here's the thing. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. So every statistical model has some sort of error somewhere. But certain statistical models are useful at getting at the truth. And so you need to, be, you need to understand statistics. Um, everybody should take a statistics, uh, statistics class uh, and, and get fairly well versed in understanding uh, them. And then you come to realize that sometimes when they use statistics, they are correct. Those models are useful uh, for explaining things. Sometimes when they don't, uh, uh, some models are not useful at all. So, um, nope, here's a repeat, sorry. And we talked a little bit about this on levels of certainty, okay? So a guess is the lowest level of certainty. Hypothesis, theory, law. Theory and law are the highest levels of certainty of how we know for certain. Um, and so here's a hear this often, that evolution is just a theory, and, and then, yeah, you could say all of science is just a theory, and, and then do we kick out science? Well, no, because those people who say it's just a theory don't really understand science enough to even know what the word theory means. So, formulate a question, remember our uh, flashlight thing? Um, does coffee help improve mental performance? We read the relevant uh, literature, the peer-reviewed, uh, literature. Peer review means that the author has to submit their work uh, to experts in the field. And the experts 
the author doesn't know who is reviewing their work. So author sends in their work to an editor, editor sends it out to uh, experts in those fields, and they thoroughly, and they thoroughly go through it. And they, let me tell you, they are brutal, um, very, very brutal, um, uh, very, very nitpicky. Um, if you've ever thought your English teacher was tough, uh, you should try submitting science, a science paper and see, see what happens. Even, even the most seasoned of scientists, their work gets torn apart by peer review uh, because it weeds out sloppy research. It weeds out bias. Uh, it re weeds out closed-mindedness. Um, that peer review, that anonymous peer review, uh, is, helps self-correct to keep science valid. Um, and sometimes you'll get su pseudoscience, uh, and that pseudoscience itself uh, will um, makes people distrust science, uh, but. Uh, hopefully you'll start to be able to pick out what science is pseudoscience and, and invalid and so you don't start lumping everything that claims is science into the same uh, same part of your brain so you realize that they're different and that the actual science is very valid but the pseudoscience is not. Okay, So that is part four. There's some questions coming up um, and we're going to we're going to talk uh, uh, a bit of, uh, a bit more about science itself, and I know uh, this chapter's lecture was really long, and the rest of the chapters probably won't be nearly as long until we get to the evolution and ecology. But uh, just keep at it, uh, and um, because this is very, very important.